Thank you everyone for coming this morning. Today I'm going to talk to you about outer space and how the mysteries of the universe can help inspire children to write better. Many scientists and authors have tried to capture the vast hugeness of space. Carl Sagan was very fond of describing it in terms of billions and billions of billions. But I think Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, really hit the nail on the head. Space is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's peanuts compared to space. So with that in mind, I'd like to do a little exercise that we do with our kids when we need to get them thinking creatively. I want you to unzip your brains, un unzip your brains, <laughs> stir around your creative juices, and we're gonna try and put the vastness of space into perspective. This little blob of pixels is the Earth. And it's to scale. At this scale, the digital Earth is only 25 pixels in diameter. Here's Jupiter, the, next, the largest planet to scale. Here's Pluto, the tiniest, only about four pixels in diameter. And here's the Sun, just over 2,749 pixels in diameter. Here we have the inner solar system with all the orbits to scale. The Sun is only 21.8 pixels. The Earth, a mere 0.198 pixels. The circle that is around Earth is a, th is a hundred times larger than Earth really is. Moving out a little bit, we have the outer solar system. The gray dot is the inner solar system. And at this scale, the sun is only half of a pixel large. Beyond Pluto lies the Oort cloud, a giant cloud of debris and the source of all comets. It's cl the cloud extends about 1.5 light years from the sun. Going out further still, we have the Alpha Centauri star system, which is the closest to our own. It is just about four and one-third light years away. Using the uh, FTL jump drive, Galactica would, uh, the Battlestar Galactica would arrive almost instantaneously. The USS Enterprise would arrive in about two minutes, going at warp five. A little more realistically, it would take Voyager 1, the fastest moving man-made object, about 77 Oh, 77,000 years to reach it. There are 13 known planets, dwarf planets, gas planets, and terrestrial planets in our solar system. To date, scientists have discovered 899 exosolar planets, that's planets orbiting other stars. But how many more could there be? A lot. The Kepler mission, which discovered 132 of the confirmed planets and over 3,000 unconfirmed planets has surveyed just one quarter of 1% 1 of the night sky. Getting bigger, the Milky Way is about 120 light years in diameter and contains between 100 and 400 billion stars. There are an estimated over 2 billion galaxies in the universe, and the observable universe is just over 99 93 billion light years in diameter and getting bigger every second. And as we already mentioned, because of the immensity of space, it takes forever to get anywhere. But consider this, when you are standing still, you're moving very fast. As a point of reference, the speed of sound on Earth is 768 miles an hour. At the equator, the Earth rotates at 1,070 miles an hour. The Earth is orbiting the sun at uh, 67,000 miles an hour. The solar system is flying through the Milky Way at 490,000 miles an hour. And the galaxy is moving through the universe at 872,402 miles an hour, over 1,100 times as fast as the speed of sound. So now you have just an inkling of the size, the scale of the universe, just the slightest motion of how big the universe really is. Is your mind blown? Are you ready? <laughs> All right, are we ready to dig deep into writing? As David mentioned, I work here. Whenever I tell people that I work at a space travel supply company, I get a lot of raised eyebrows. You mean like NASA, people ask? It's easier to tell people that I work 
here. 826 Seattle, a writing and tutoring center for kids. 826 Seattle is part of a national organization that was started in 2002 by educator Nineveh Caligari and writer David Edgers, the author of heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius, What is the What, and founder of McSweeney's Publishing. The original center, located at 826 Valencia Street, is called 826 Valencia. It is in the Mission District of San Francisco. The neighborhood is zoned for retail, and as a requirement of their lease, they had to have a retail storefront. Somewhat flippantly, Dave said, fine, we'll open a pirate supply shop, which they did. They discovered that not only did the storefront make money to support the center's programs, it also attracted kids and donors. What kind of kid would not want to come to a tutoring center that sold buckets of lard, boxes of mermaid tears, and pirate hooks? The second chapter to open was in Brooklyn. They just decided to try a similar model and opened a superhero supply store. Again, the store attracted children, served as an outreach tool, and helped raise money to support the programs, all of which are offered for free. It was decided that all the chapters would follow a similar model, a unique attention-getting storefront with a tutoring center in the back. The 826 chapter, 826 Seattle, was founded and started by educator Terry Hine. In 2004, Terry was the head teacher at the Hutch School, an accredited Seattle public school located within the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And she decided that she wanted to open a writing center for kids. Dave had worked with Terry as a guest teacher at the Hutch School and invited her to come check out the 826 program in San Francisco. In 2005, Terry and her fledgling writing center were invited to become the fourth 826 chapter. We opened our doors in October 2005. 826 Seattle offers five programs. After school tutoring, writing workshops, field trips, <laughs> publishing projects, and in-school support. The amazing thing, everything we do, for, we do for free. Every year we serve over 3,000 kids and are supported by active volunteer base of over 400 people, including rocket scientists, mathematicians, former teachers, future teachers, and rock stars. The store was conceived of and built by a group of volunteer creative writers and designers, including Bethany Jean Clement, now the food editor at The Stranger, Paul Hughes, freelance writer and co-founder of Postcardly, Thad Boss, principal and creative director at Studio Relux, and Jill Leitner, freelance writer, editor, web producer at Edible Seattle Magazine. Space travel was chosen as the store's theme for a couple of reasons. Our long-standing connection with our, the aeronautics industry. Boeing is historically one of the largest employers in the region and has been building spacecraft since the beginning of the space race. Here you can see the production of the Mercury capsules. Seattle is also home of Microsoft <laughs> <laughs> and many other companies on the cutting edge of technological innovation. The city's history as the city of the future, resulting from the 62 World's Fair, known as the Century 21 Exhibition. Early concepts focused on a futuristic look, but these were eventually abandoned as being too cliche. Instead, we drew our inspiration from the past in the mid-century period of the space race. There are a few reasons that why this, we felt this period of design would serve as a more interesting inspiration. Design in the early 60s was in an unprecedented period of innovation. And the entire country was captivated by the space race and, draw, and the dawn of human space exploration. Anything was possible, technologically, experientially, and socially. There exists almost limited source material for us to use as inspiration. So let's look at some of the products that we've designed from scratch or other items that we've repurposed and turned into tra space travel supplies. The first is the map of the known universe. The map was inspired by a National Geographic map of the universe I had pinned to my wall as a kid. This map highlights many aspects of the Greenwood space travel design voice. The mid of youth century inspired fonts, including Gotham and Las Vegas, limited color palette, a simplified iconic graphics to communicate complex ideas, and an alternate history in which humans have been traveling to the stars since the 60s and setting up outposts and colonies. The map was designed by our former design intern, Spencer Charles, who is now a senior designer at Louis Philippe Limited in New York City. Next, we have one of our surprise hits, the panic button. For this item, we created an entire company and brand from scratch, Panic Industries, influenced by this Collier's Magazine advertisement by Lester Beale. 
Here we have our cherry scented diversion deployment system, which is a smoke ring gun, inspired by the many toy ray guns popular in the 50s and 60s. Here we have our line of baby clothing, little baby Sputnik, inspired by the beginning of the space race and featuring the first, space, the first satellite in space, the first man in space, and the first woman in space. Because all of these were Russian achievements, we took our cues from Cold War propaganda posters. These three items were designed by another former design intern, Julianne Bork, who now works at Mint Design in Seattle. One of the most recent additions to our catalog is our line of Captain T. McGillicuddy merchandise. Captain T. McGillicuddy is the store's mascot and serves as the voice for all of our promotional materials. The concept was inspired by early space heroes like Tom Corbett, Flash Gordon, and Buck Rogers. Here we brought the captain back to his comic back roots. Illustrator and former design intern Elaine Lynn created a series of short comic panels highlighting some of his regular adventures, and all of them involve cats. <laughs> These are just some of the examples of our product line. We have over 350 items stuffed into our small 500 square foot store and our website, thegreenwoodspacetravelsupply.com. Now I'd like to share some of the ways that we use the space theme is integrated into 826 Seattle programming. In order to get to the center, you have to walk through the store and approach the atomic teleporter, which serves as a gateway into another world. It may look like a simple rotating darkroom door, but it really transports kids into a whole new world. <laughs> 826 Seattle offers five different programs, after school tutoring, writing workshops, field trips, publishing projects, and in schools assistance. After school tutoring is pretty straightforward. Comes ki kids come and do their homework with the help of our volunteer tutoring staff. What do they do when they're finished and waiting to be picked up? One thing they can do is pick up the stop and jot notebook and complete a quick writing exercise. When the students finish a writing exercise, they get to move their marker to the next stop of the stop and jot universe. If they make it all the way back home by the end of the, sem by the, end of the semester, they're rewarded with a pizza party. Another thing that they can do is uh, join our songwriting club. The music that you heard when you came in was all songs written by kids, uh, including I'm a Panda, My Cat Poops Everywhere, <laughs> and How to Pronounce Fa. <laughs> every weekend and during the summer, we have writing workshops. The theme of every workshop great, varies greatly. We've had everything from notes to goats, where kids visit the Puget Sound Goat Rescue, learn about goats, and return to write letters and notes to their favorite, to I Spies, where students dressed up as in spy outfits, dispersed through the neighborhood, and return to write invented histories of the people they observed. Some workshops are space-themed. These have included Star Words, The New Hope, Space Foods, Out of This World Recipes, and Travel Writing for Aliens. One of our favorite annual events is the Great Pluto Debate, which is a reaction to the 2006 AIU decision that defined for the first time the term planet. Of the three criteria required, Pluto did meet the requirement of a neighborhood cleared of debris. As a result, in the eyes of the Astronomical Union anyway, Pluto was no longer considered a planet. We have been protesting this injustice ever since. <laughs> Our first protest included a march down Greenwood Avenue, a sit-in at Neptune Cafe, which is really the name of the cafe across the street from us and a workshop for students to write persuasive essays, perfect chants and short slogans, or to argue in classical debate fashion. Our first protest march and rally sported a ragtag group of no more than 15 people. This year, over 40 demonstrators and protesters, including, including Mayor Mike McGinn, marched in our Pluto Day celebrations. In fact, the mayor was so moved by the event that he declared March 13th Pluto Day in Seattle. <laughs> 826 Seattle also offers free field trips to Washington teachers. We have four different field trips, all with the same goal, inspiring students to find fun in writing. While each field trip is tailored to a specific age group, the sequence is similar for each. The class enters the center, gets their author photo taken, and sits down to collectively write the beginning of the story. They learn about the necessary ingredients of storytelling, plot, characters, dialogue, and finish by writing a conclusion on their own. In 2011, our programming team joined forces with long-term supporter cartoonist David Lasky and developed a comic book field trip. This field trip is geared towards late elementary age students and features a comic space adventure. Students learn about combining drawing and words to build an engaging story. In 2011, we were approached by Curtis Wong, principal researcher at Microsoft Research. 
His team was finishing development on a breakthrough technology called Worldwide Telescope. This software, available to free, for free to anyone, stitches together millions of images of outer space into a seamless interactive experience. Think Google Earth on a galactic scale. With this powerful software, you can fly through the visible universe, land on Mars, and view stars in a variety of electromagnetic spectrums. The most engage exciting part of the software, at least from our perspective, is its storytelling component, which allows users to create narrated guided tours. We're going to take a quick look at one of, the, uh, one of these tours that was created for us. I have to switch the computer, so bear with me. All right, we'll forgo the tour. <laughs> uh, but the fly through, it allows you to fly through all of the solar system, all of the universe, all of the galaxy. So um, in the workshop that the tour was created for, students wrote short science fiction stories. They described these stories to, uh, to, astro or to astronomy uh, students at the University of Washington Astronomy Department. The students then read and recorded their stories, and in the most exciting part of the workshop, students viewed and their narrated tours in the UW Planetarium. As one of the students said excitedly, it's like I'm up there in the sky. <laughs> We've also used the Worldwide Telescope as the foundation for our strange adventures in infinite space field trip. In this field trip, classes are pre use a pre-designed Worldwide Telescope tour as inspiration for their own science fiction adventure. They learn about second person present tense narratives, observations and inferences, and brainstorming details to add richness to their story. Like many of our field trips, they start as a group and build the foundations of the story. They then break into smaller groups and continue writing the narrative to a cliffhanger moment. They finish by writing the conclusions of the story independently. All the while, volunteers are dropping the narratives into a chapbook template filled with all sorts of visual details and information. Some true, some not so true. <laughs> the chapbooks are printed and assembled, and each student leaves with their very own book. These are just some of the examples that we use the theme of outer space, that the theme of outer space enters our after school tutoring workshops and field trip programs. I count myself l lucky to work at a place like 826 Seattle. It's not everyone who gets to say that they work at a space travel supply store, but more than getting to satisfy my inner nerd, I think that the work we do is fundamentally important. Let's face it, the American education system could use a little help. Research shows a strong correlation between arts education and the ability to problem solve, think critically and creatively, and deal with ambiguity and complexity. The arts include everything from creative writing to music, visual art to drama. Unfortunately, over the past several decades, as budgets shrink, the arts and humanities have started to disappear from curriculums. Indeed, schools are focusing on subjects and skills that are easier to test and methods that do not actively encourage creativity. By many metrics, the current structure of the American education system fails to capture and retain the attention of students. American students lag behind other industrialized countries in most subjects, including writing skills. According to the 2008 report by National Assessment of Educational Progress, only 33% of eighth graders and 24% of 12th graders performed at or above proficient levels in writing. While schools face limited resources, organizations like a 2 6 Seattle have grown to support teachers in schools and take, on, take the task of engaging children to think creatively. And what is the best way to engage children? Create a place where imagination and creativity are king. Everything about our building, from the storefront filled with entertaining but educational toys, to the teleporter, to the bright and colorful center, to the unusual curriculum, has been designed to make it clear to anyone who enters that this is a place that champions and encourages creativity. You want to tell a story about a rhinoceros fashion show? Who wouldn't? You want to create a new food based on ingredients you found on Mars? Let me get the saucepan. At a place like 826 Seattle, anything and everything is possible. 
As an added benefit when kids are having fun, writing off the wall stories about goats orchestrating a diamond heist, it's easy to slip in a little learning to correct their comma usage or to tell them how to more effectively use a semicolon or to get them to come up with a more interesting way of saying the goat could not swallow one more carrot. <laughs> I believe that creativity is not something that can be taught. It is something, an inherent trait in, that every child is born with. Spend any time talking to our children and it becomes quickly evident that they see the world and the universe filled with wonder and possibility. As we get older, we encounter world, a world of no. No, you can't do it this way. That is wrong. No, you can't color outside of the lines. No, you can't write a story about a secret society of Mayan meteor hunters. You have to write your essay about dirt. <laughs> bit by bit, this chips away at our self-confidence to take these creative leaps. Our fear of making a fool of ourselves overcomes our desire to reach for the stars, and we become firmly rooted on terra firma. Any attempt to break free is really a struggle. As we get older, our inner world doesn't grow, it shrinks. To illustrate this, I'd like to share an observation about our field trips. Our field trip geared towards the youngest students is called Gooey Duck Publishing. In the field trip, the students collaboratively write a story to appease the grouchy publisher, Mr. Gooey Duck and help the field trip leader get his job back. The young students have no problem buying into this theatrical scenario. They believe without a doubt that Mr. Gooey Duck is real, even though they never see him, or that a fur-covered mitten is really his long-suffering and nervous assistant, Harriet the Harried Helping Hand. <laughs> the story we write is based on suggestions from students. Though they may be a little hesitant at first, once they understand that any suggestion, no matter how crazy, is a good suggestion, the ideas come flowing fast and furious. We've written stories about fire-breathing hot dogs, invisible cats, time-traveling mermaids, just to name a few. Our field trip for slightly older students is based on Choose Your Own Adventure stories. The student suggestions are still the foundation of the stories, and they do get pretty crazy. But compared to the Gooey Duck field trip, the storylines are more formulaic and informed by popular memes, things like zombie attacks or space adventures. Pulling truly original ideas out of these older students is more difficult and met with greater hesitation. A couple of times we have run our Gooey Duck field trip for a group of adults. And in every instance, getting the audience to offer up unique and creative ideas was incredibly difficult. In one instance, we were writing a book in honor of an employee who was leaving to go to graduate school. Plot ideas included things like, Alice is going on an adventure to school where she meets a professor and some other students. <laughs> Even though the group was participating was a pretty creative group, it was clear that something had eroded their willingness to take wild creative leaps and that self-censorship was blocking entrance to their inner imaginations. This, I believe, is why the work we do at 826 Seattle is important, and why we do things the way we do them, to reteach kids that, that there is no limit to their imagination, that creative thinking is important, and that the world and the universe is full of wonder and excitement. As you get ready to go to work in whatever creative field you find yourself in today, I urge you to keep in mind the vastness of the universe, the limitless number of possibilities, and the billions and billions of new ways New ideas just ready to be explored. Thank you. All right. So we're going to take five minutes. And the question that I want everyone to sort of think about and explore a little bit here is, is this. I want you I want you to find somebody in the audience or a, a couple of other people in the audience and ask them the question, as a child, what were the things that helped them uncover and explore creativity? The kids at 826 are in incredibly fortunate to have that as a resource. And um, I, I'm curious to hear you all talk a little bit about you as, as kids growing up. What helped you get to sort of where you're at now? So let's do that for five minutes. Not a big commitment. Uh, and then we'll get back into Q&A here. All right, we're going to go back to some Q&A here. Thanks. All right. 
Uh, when we were discussing in our little groups um, about what made us creative as kids, I think the general consensus was having uh, some positive reinforcement as children. When I was in fifth grade, I wrote a story about um, uh, the life cycle of a salmon. And I remember it was about a paragraph long, and the teacher was like, oh my god, you just, oh, you have to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> And then Sue was telling a story about uh, when she was in fifth grade, she was in a jazz band. <laughs> and that having adults say, oh my gosh, you're doing really well, you're doing really good, even though you, know, you sound like a car wreck, <laughs> encouraged her to go on and um, study music. So do we have any uh, questions? Any questions at all? The uh, narrated, the tour was just uh, the visuals. We didn't have any narration of it, uh, any kid story with it. it. It's uh, a little tricky to fly places effectively. <laughs> so you end up like spinning around a planet and then you're just kind of stuck. But we, we did do uh, the UW Planetarium field trip. They uh, narrated their stories independently and it was recorded and then they watched the playback of their tour with their um, story back to it. It's pretty exciting. The kids had a, a blast. To be in a planetarium where that, the whole visual is around, wrapped around you was pretty intense. Uh, a lot of our students that come to our center are um, fam from families from immigrant families. So a lot of them are English learners. Uh, one of the kids that you saw probably a lot of pictures of <laughs> uh, is um, totally blanking on her name. Edom. Edom uh, has been speaking English for about a year and she wrote the song, the friendship song, which you probably couldn't hear too well, but she was up on stage with Ben Gibbard and um, the other child performing uh, the friendship song, and so we do a lot of work with kids who are who have just moved here, and we do a lot of in schools work where we go to uh, help teachers who are also uh, English language learner teachers. And we don't have a specific curriculum for it, but it it gets wrapped in to everything that we do. Uh, every year we have a conference where we all get together and meet all of everyone from all of the chapters and that just happened uh, in Washington DC a couple weeks ago and then we each department kind of talks to their related department once or twice a month and then we also email each other all the time and ask for feedback and what works and what doesn't and ideas and resources. The greatest challenges are finding enough space to cram all our kids. <laughs> we, um, for the very first time this past school year, had to turn people away to our after school tutoring because we had too many kids. Um, it was jam packed full of kids. The building that we occupy because of the weird teleport door has a very, very small occupancy, even though the building is pretty huge. So we filled up and uh, we had to start a wait list for kids. We also expanded to high school tutoring this year, so we were able to move a lot of the high schoolers to a later period. But every day we have anywhere from 35 to 45 kids in our center in just the after school tutoring. And the field trips are usually 35 kids, 25 to 35 kids. So finding enough space is our biggest challenge right now. <laughs> um, oh boy. <laughs> Volunteer at 826. I, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, it is refreshing to be around kids who are really don't have any barrier to, and they will say anything, and they will do anything, and they will think that anything is possible. And for people who kind of get stuck in that rut of being around other adults who are very um, no oriented. Being around kids can really be um, a weight lifted off your shoulders. And also, uh, stop. I mean, I, there's no other advice except to stop doing it. <laughs> Say no to no. <laughs> I 
I think that uh, it does. It can be a double-edged sword in a lot of ways. Uh, when a lot of the kids that come to our center don't have access to technology at home, so when they have access to technology at our center, they get very excited and they um, cre some create some really cool things. When we first opened, we had we got a bunch of laptops with uh, cameras in, which was new at the time, and. We had a, a kid who every day would come and make a little stop animation story, <laughs> a little movie. Um, and then we also get, they, they also, there's a lot of games to play and a lot of time to waste on the internet. <laughs> so I think it is a, it's a great tool if, if kids use it correctly. And, They hired me. <laughs> I managed the retail store. So we had to hire a whole extra staff person, which for a nonprofit can get really expensive and it's a little trying. So when I first started, I only did that half time, and my other part time job was organizing events, coordinating events. Um, so, and every center f faces it a little different. Some of them have hired full time staff people, and some of them have hired uh, interns to do it, which is its own sort of challenge, <laughs> is having, kind of turning everything, your money-making tool over to uh, interns who are only going to be there for a little bit and don't invest as much as a paid staff person. So it's a challenge. Any other questions? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't think we have one planned right now. Uh, we don't have one planned, but A826 says wants people to copy their uh, their formula without becoming a chapter. So there are a couple of 826-like organizations out there. There's the Bat Cave in Austin, Texas, and the Ministry of Stories, which is in the UK. Um, so they have a little weird storefront and then a tutoring center with kind of the same uh, be crazy attitude. So they're always encouraging people to open one. There's another one in Portland, which I can't remember the name of it, but there, there are more opening around the country and in other countries. Uh, we, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm looking at my boss. <laughs> Terry said. <laughs> uh, we are looking, we've, we've done, tried to do a little, uh, some, have a satellite or to pair reach with outreach with other uh, organizations and it's worked and it hasn't worked and we are definitely looking to we're up located up in the north end and we have a whole south end neighborhood that needs uh, needs us too so it's always it's always it's hard to say <laughs> probably <laughs> any other questions Our, oh Yes. <laughs> we uh, get high school kids who are doing French or German or Russian, not Russian, Spanish. Uh, <laughs> and we do have families that uh, speak Eritrean and um, Ethiopian, Imaric. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's need e either to communicate with our parents and also we do have kids who are needing some education help. No. Um, the writing curriculums are open to anything. So the writing workshops this month are, see they made uh, food out of, of Play-Doh. <laughs> so they were getting kids to uh, think about creating, uh, combining different disparate things. There was a writing workshop where they learned to break the rules, so they kind of got a foundation of what the English language rules were, and then they broke them, which is very experimental. <laughs> Kids are all being beat poets. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's really whatever. Our, our workshops are all led by volunteers. 
So it's whatever the volunteer wants to teach about and talk about. Any more? Any more? Does working there keep you young? <laughs> you age faster? Uh, <laughs> a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, I am a pretty immature person anyway. So <laughs> as my coworkers will tell you, I'm the noisiest, loudest, uh, most obnoxious person there. And I fit in well with the children. As one of the, actually one of the kids said, Justin, you are the noisiest adult I've ever met. <laughs> so I, I'm kind of young at heart anyway, but um, working 60 hours a week is hard. But it's definitely worth it. it keeps your heart young. Probably not your face, but. <laughs> so uh, to volunteer, go to our website, fill out the form, and you'll be invited to an orientation where you, it's a little hour-long orientation about all that we do. And usually what the commitment depends on the program. So tutoring, we ask for a three-month commitment. Uh, workshops. Writing workshops, you should have a writing or a teaching background, uh, but you can also assist, and that is whenever we need help, so that you, a workshop is generally two or three sessions. Uh, field trips, we ask for at least a three-month commitment because the different parts of the workshop are all very involved and um, it takes a lot to learn. The store, you can come volunteer for a, a day, and I would love you. <laughs> so we have a very hard time filling volunteer shifts in our store. Um, so it, it all depends on your availability. We're pretty flexible. I'll take you and then you. Yeah, we've, we've had a writing workshop that was learning, using um, improv to write little scripts. We've had songwriting. We have had I, my, my staff is mouthing stuff to me. <laughs> uh, we had a book of plays. Uh, we have one available called um, In Our Hood, <laughs> which is what they wanted to write about. Uh, and some of the, the plays are really funny about, you know, <laughs> little short scenes from home. Um, so we have had non-narrative related writing. We also do uh, essay writing for high school students who need to write their personal essays for college. And then you had a question? Our high school, uh, volunteer, or the kids that come either vary between eight uh, up to about 15, 20. It's getting bigger every, every week. There's another kid <laughs> who needs help with physics. <laughs> All right. Uh, the one thing that I didn't talk about was publications, and we do wrap a lot into little chapbooks that we sell in our store, and then we publish an anthology uh, every year called What to Read in the Rain, and the What to Read in the Rain book combines uh, adult writing, so we have, we go out to local authors and ask them to contribute a story, and then it, we also have a lot of student writing. We put it into an anthology, and we sell these anthologies to hotels and ask them to put them in their room on the bedside table so visitors who come to Seattle can uh, take home this book with kid writing and adult writing. And it's usually theme related to rain <laughs> or the Pacific Northwest travel location. Uh, so we publish that anthology. We also have a magazine called The Genesis, uh, which we publish online. And we also have a couple printed copies. Uh, and we have, it is a, a requirement of an 826 chapter to publish annually, so we do have a variety of publications that we uh, do every year. And they're available at our store or on our website. All right. Anyone else? All right. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>